Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Nigeria's consumerist economy, a government uh, protectionist stance, and reluctance to join the planned African continental free trade area will ultimately also elate Nigeria, some people argue, and deprive millions of Nigerians a chance to escape what has been called a looming tsunami of poverty. And that's according to an opinion uh, put together by a commentator in Bloomberg. We are joining us now from our Rice London studio to discuss this and other issues is Renu Omokri, an aide to former President Goodluck Jonathan and a social media activist. Renu, we also, in the course of the interview, address his global campaign to free Leah Sharibo from the clutches of terrorist group Boko Haram. Renu, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Dr. Abati. Yes, Reno, good to see you again. Yes, thank you very much. Now, let's start with Leah Sharibo. You have been, uh, you know, running a campaign, a free Leah Sharibo campaign. You've been going from continent to continent uh, to mobilize uh, support. Can you uh, let us in into some of the things you've done, particularly, you know, mobilizing support and then, you know, providing support also for the family? And how important is this campaign to you? Well, this campaign is very important to me because Leah Sharibu is being held captive, not because she's a girl, not because she's done anything wrong, but she's been held captive by her faith. Now, I'm an ordained minister, and it's very difficult for me to watch somebody who is being held by her faith. She was 14. So actually, she was 13 when she was abducted. She turned 14 um, uh, in, with her captors, and um, she turned 15, sorry, with her captors, and uh, two days ago she was 16. So I wrote this book, Leah Sharibu, The Girl That Boko Haram Left Behind, and I gave the proceeds of this book, the entire proceeds of this book, to her parents. Now, it was very important to me because they have one other child in Dapchi. And, you, you, I mean, it's, it's important to get that child out of Dapchi. And then after I did that, I decided to go around the whole world, every country on earth, until she's released. You know, so um, this year alone, I've been to 19 countries um, in all the continents except South America. I should be going to South America um, in about two weeks to try to promote the message. And I've been um, wearing uh, these clothes. I mean, you can see it here, right here. Um, it says, Free Leah Sharibu. You know, I wear it. And we've been selling them. Uh, we've been selling the clothes. And uh, the funds go directly to Leah Sharibu's parents. We've raised um, um, a sufficient amount of money, but I don't want to say it online. But, you know, it's very important to me to do this. Three weeks ago, I was with uh, Boris Johnson, uh, the former UK foreign secretary and uh, former mayor of London, and we talked about this campaign. He agreed. He actually was the first person to model the free Leah Sharibu, um, is it here? Yeah, free Leah Sharibu um, clothes. And... You know, after that incident, you know, I think he made some moves, and then the Pope, uh, he, Pope uh, Francis, he called President Muhammad Buhari. So this is very important to me. This girl has been in captivity now for over 400 days. We see that President Muhammad Buhari, if he really wants to do something, he can do something. Look at the girl in Saudi Arabia, Zainab Ali. The president personally contacted the Saudi authorities, and he made things happen. So we see that if the president wants to act, if President Muhammad Buhari really wants to act, he can make things happen. He got Zainab Aliyu back. Zainab is now back in Kano. Now, why the priority with Zainab, and why isn't he showing that priority with Leah Sharibu? What has he done to bring back Leah Sharibu in all this time that, I mean, that, that she's been with her captors? What has he done? We know for a fact that Boko Haram have said that they are willing to deal, they are willing to uh, negotiate, to exchange her for prisoners. Now, why is this government dragging its feet? So, basically, I'm doing this because uh, before I started to do this campaign, Leah Sharibu's issue had died down. And I said, no, I'm not going to allow it to die down. I have a, a daughter. My daughter is going to be, um, she's going to be uh, 14 in uh, two weeks. My daughter, I have a daughter who, when I look at her, I see Leah Sharibu. What if it was my daughter in captivity? So I'm going around the whole world, and I'm telling people, leaders in every country I go to, that this is what has happened. The Nigerian government has a responsibility to get this girl out there, and this is what you can do to make sure that this happens. 
First, I'd like to commend you for your activism on behalf of Leah Sharibu. It's honorable thank you for turning her into an international cause celeb. As soon as she gets home, the sooner she gets home, the better for all of us. But that aside, it's been argued while you have proposed this idea of a lack of diligence on the part of President Buhari in the past. And it's been argued that you're drawing a false equivalence in the case of Zainab Aliyu. The circumstances of her detention were completely different from that of Leah Sharibu. And should the government be negotiating with terrorists at all? And also, are you just alleging a lack of diligence in the efforts to rescue Leah Sharibu? Or are you alleging that a cover-up happened regarding her capture in the first instance. Okay, well, um, I'm having difficulty hearing you, um, but I, I, I think I heard something where you said that uh, the, the situation with uh, Zena Baliu is different with uh, uh, Leah Sharibu, and that um, uh, the, should the government, uh, in, in fact, be negotiating with terrorists. Well, let me tell you, this administration, if that's what you said, because I didn't hear you very clearly, but this administration has negotiated with terrorists. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm a researcher. I deal in facts. I'm not, I mean, I have a reputation for dealing with the facts. I have it in my book, my number one bestseller, Facts versus Fiction, The True Story of the Jonathan Years. I also have some details in this book. The Muhammad Ibuari administration negotiated with Boko Haram. The, I mean, um, the, President Muhammad Ibuari likes to say that he rescued some Chiba girls. That is a lie. Muhammad Buhari, the president, lied. He did not rescue anybody. The army did not rescue anybody. Those, they, they negotiated with Boko Haram. And don't forget, the minister of uh, defense, Dan Ali, said that they have back channels and that they used those back channels. This administration has not uh, stormed the camp of Boko Haram and rescued girls. No. In each instance where they have gotten some girls back, it has been a process of negotiation. So it's a moot point saying that, do I want the government to negotiate with terrorists, if that's what you said, because I didn't hear you clearly. They have already negotiated with terrorists. I'm quoting you, the Minister of Defense said, we have a back channel. Now, you're saying that the case of Zainab Aliyu is different from the case of um, um, Leah Sharibu. How so? Zainab Aliyu was wrongly accused, or so that, that's what we, we were told, in Saudi Arabia. Now, the president, President Muhammad Buhari, got personally involved. He did not delegate this to another person. According to what the presidency told us, that he got personally involved. He contacted his counterparts in Saudi Arabia. He made things happen. Now, what we are saying is this. We know for a fact that Boko Haram, they themselves, they have said, we are ready to negotiate. They, we, they have said so. And we know that in the past, this administration, has negotiated with Boko Haram. By their own admission, they have back channels to Boko Haram. So if they have negotiated in the past to get people, uh, the uh, certain Chibok girls, if they have negotiated in the past to get things to happen, why are they not doing that in the case of Leah Sharibu? That's just what I'm saying. Uh, Reno, quickly. Now, on this, uh, let's just stay a little bit on the Leah Sharibu case. And if I may play the devil's advocate. President Buhari has made it clear that he's committed to ensuring that no Dapchi girl is left behind and that Leah Sharibu is freed. And then I think there are two other persons, Red Cross workers, who are also uh, still in uh, captivity. Now, but you don't seem to trust him. Some of your critics say, well, on social media, you use very strong words uh, against uh, President Buhari, and that you are doing this because uh, President Buhari won election in 2015, and the Jonathan administration had to leave. And he has won again uh, in uh, 2019, you know, uh, and that Nigerians trust him to have voted for him twice. Do you agree with your critics that this is a case of sour grief sometimes when you keep, you know, attacking uh, President Buhari? I mean, how can it be a case of sour grapes? When I, I mean, that, that's, that's completely preposterous. I am more successful now outside government than I was, when, I mean, ever been, been in government. I'm a number one best-selling author. I was at the U.S. Congress. I mean, I, you just, uh, three weeks ago, I was with Boris Johnson, who's likely to become the next UK prime minister. I've met with Theresa May. I'm making, I mean, I'm very successful in the things that I'm doing outside government. So, I mean, how can it be so grips? So, I, mean, that, that, I mean, anybody who is saying that is silly. This is a humanitarian effort. I have a daughter. And I mean, no, you, Dr. Abati, you have kids. I've seen, I mean, I, I, I've seen your kids. Look, let's empathize. Let's think about this girl. This man says that he's committed to bringing her back. Look, 
actions speak louder than words. What has his commitment? What we? What has? What? 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 What, what has his commitment brought about? We know this man. They, I mean, like he has said several things in the past that he doesn't even mean. Sometimes he doesn't even know what he's saying. People just write these things down, and the man reads it. What has he shown by? What actions has he shown that to show that? Has he, has he taken to show that he's committed? The girl is with Boko Haram. Boko Haram, they've said as recently as two days ago that they are willing to negotiate. What steps has this man taken? And you're talking about sour grapes. Look, I'm going to tell you something. Everything I've said about Muhammad Buhari are facts. I have not said, I have not come out to say anything about him that I know facts because I pride myself in dealing with facts. This man does not have the credibility, neither does he have the intellectual capacity to lead Nigeria out of the crisis that he led Nigeria into. Look, the man came in 2015 and said that his strongest point was corruption. Now, Nigeria is more corrupt today than in 2015 when he became president. And this is not coming from me. This is not coming from the PDP. This is coming from Transparency International, a fact that was just uh, uh, um, buttressed again by Bloomberg. Nigeria made her best improvement in the Corruption Perception Index in 2014 when we moved 12 steps forward. We were 148, and then we moved and we became 136. Now, under Muhammad Buhari, we have gone backwards. Now we are 144. We were 148 last year. Uh, now we are 144. So what are you talking about? This man says he's fighting corruption. He's secretary to the government of the Federation, Babachi Lawal, a man caught with his hand red-handed in the cookie jar. What happened? It was people like me and others that were put in pressure. And after two years, they did a show, they sh they did a show arraignment just before the election to deceive Nigerians. But what happened? What has happened after that? Three weeks ago, this man who was caught with his hand in the cookie jar said he is even considering, considering contesting for elections in 2023. This is a man who his wife, Aisha Buhari, her ADC was exposed by Premium Times. He had extorted about 2.2 billion. There was a show arrest. What has happened to that man? Nothing has happened to him. Look. In uh, on that president, former President Jonathan Abdul Rashid Minor, the biggest thief in Nigeria's public service, was hounded. There was a manhunt. The man had to run out of the country, escaped. He was put on Interpol's watch list. That man was brought back by this administration, reinstated, recalled, given double promotion. When the Nigerian Senate went to, went to do a probe to find out how this happened, this president, Muhammad Dubwari, sent his attorney general, Malami, to court to get a restraining order to stop the Senate from investigating it. The man lied that he did not know about it until there was a leaked memo by the head of service of the Federation showing that she had told him two days even before it had happened. $25 billion was awarded at the NMPC in contracts without due process. This was leaked by the Minister of State for Petroleum. What happened? There was no internal audit. There was no, there was no external investigation. And you are telling me that this man is fighting corruption? Nigeria has never been as corrupt as it is today under this man. And these are facts. These are not facts from Renault Mokri. Transparency International is saying it. Now, Bloomberg is saying it. As a matter of fact, the title of Bloomberg's opinion is Going Nowhere Fast. Nigeria's performance on selected indicators and indexes is going down. So, so I look, ask you I did your views on These that. Are grips. I want to ask you your views on that Bloomberg report. The most evocative imagery they used there was that phrase, tsunami of poverty. I mean, that does stand out in one's mind. In a tsunami, everybody drowns. Do you think this is hyperbole, or is this what we're really facing? It's not hyperbole. We are facing that. Nigeria is now the world headquarters for extreme poverty. Every six seconds in Nigeria, 10 people go into poverty every six seconds. Nigeria is now the world headquarters for extreme poverty. Look, as a matter of fact, last year, Nigeria overtook India as the country with the most out-of-school children population in the world. The amazing thing is that India has six times our population. In Nigeria, there are 12 million children that are out of school. In Kanu alone, there are 3 million. You think that we have crime now? You think that we have insecurity now? Just wait until those 12 million children become adults, no education. What's going to happen? Look, in, uh, in 2015, okay, we had uh, terrorism. It was localized in the Northeast. Today, right now, Nigeria, if Zamfara State is just a killing zone. Katsina, in Katsina State, the residents of Katsina, they are moving to Niger Republic. 
The, the empire of Daura, President Muhammad Buhari's own village, said, what kind, I'm quoting him, these are not my views, what kind of country is this that we live like animals? If you want to die in Nigeria today, you have a greater chance of dying than if you travel from the, uh, the Kaduna Abuja Road. The Kaduna Abuja Road, look, according to Sheikh Wusani, one of the three senators from Kaduna, an imam was invited by the Kaduna state government to pray for, for safety on the Kaduna Abuja Road. After prayers, the man was, okay, well, you can go back now. The man said, no, I am not going to go back on that road. Look, the situation in Nigeria is so terrible. In 2015, President Muhammad Ibuari said that President Jonathan was a failure in terms of security. At that time, the Global Terrorism Index said that Nigeria was the fourth most terrorized nation. As I speak to you right now, the Global Terrorism Index says Nigeria is now the third most terrorized nation. So now we are more terrorized. There is more insecurity right now. So how can you say that that is hyperbole? It's not hyperbole. It is the fact. It's the situation on ground. I'll give you a very good example. Nigerians in 2015, the minimum wage was 18,000 naira. That amount was equivalent to 130 US dollars. Today, that 18,000 naira is equivalent to less than $50. Now, they say they want to increase the minimum wage to 30,000 naira. Even that 30,000 naira cannot buy you the same amount that the 18,000 naira of 2015 could get you. This man increased the price of petroleum at a time, the price of petrol in Nigeria, at a time when the price of crude internationally dropped. Now, what are, you, what, are, what are you talking about? Nigerians are suffering for, so badly that, according to the United Nations, 136,000 Nigerians annually try to leave Nigeria through the Sahara, Sahara Desert. A lot of people die on the way. Why, do, why are Nigerians so desperate to do this? It's because of the situation at home. It is not hyperbole. Muhammad Buhari has wrecked that country. Even when that man leaves power, Nigeria will have to go through serious rehabilitation for the damage that that man has brought into that country. Well, uh, uh, Reno, um, I, I need to draw attention to two tweets on your Twitter account, one from two days ago, which is linked to what you have just said, and then there is a second one. Two days ago, you said, look at these evil people. President Mohamed Buhari and his inept administration have turned Nigeria into the world headquarters for extreme poverty. Now they would want to stop people from escaping, even when their children have visas. And uh, you quoted uh, a statement made by uh, one of the ministers, the Minister of Agriculture, Adogbe, uh, a story titled, Reduced Number of Nigerians you give visa. Federal government begs the EU. Now, do you think Nigerians should not should escape from Nigeria when you complain that they want to stop people from escaping? And where would they escape to? The United States, where Donald Trump is uh, so hard uh, on immigration policies. That's one. The second one, that was a day ago. You wrote, the free Lia Sharibu movement made me appreciate Muslims. A popular gospel star had little time for Leah. She was busy. I thank God for busy men like Apostle Suleiman, an ex-Muslim, Colonel Umar, and Senator Ndume, practicing Muslims, who did not hesitate to support Leah. Hashtag uh, Reno's uh, Nuggets. Now, who is this popular gospel star? Would you like to tell us? And what exactly happened? And uh, we seem to be hearing stories about Christians not supporting each other in Nigeria. The most recent example is that case of the pastor who committed suicide uh, somewhere in Abuja. He too asked for help from uh, fellow Christians. Nobody helped him. So, you know, do you want to comment on these uh, two issues, taken from your own uh, Twitter account? Well, I, I'll comment on these issues. What I'm going to tell you is um, th that statement was made by Aldo Obe, the Minister of Agriculture, you know, asking the EU to reduce the number of visas that they give to Nigerians. Now, under former President Jonathan, and I'm sure you know this, um, Dr. Abati, and you can verify this, you can corroborate this information. His children, all his children schooled in Nigeria. They actually schooled in Lagos. His children schooled in Nigeria. Former President Jonathan did not send his children to school abroad. They all schooled in Nigeria. Now, Muhammad Buhari, all his children, I'm not talking about some, all his children, because I deal in facts. I don't deal in uh, gossip or in uh, hearsay. I deal in facts. I know the schools that his children went to. They schooled in England. 
This fellow, Aldo Obey, that is talking right now, his own kids have visas to go abroad. Now, you have gotten this kind of freedom for your children, where you educate them abroad. You, when, when, when they are sick, you send them abroad to go for, for their health care. And then you are now hypocritically telling the same people who gave your children, your family visas, not to give Nigerians visas, because you have ruined this country. Can you see how these people are? Muhammad Dubuhari, how long does he stay in this country? He just came back from a private visit to the United Kingdom. His own wife, does she shop in Nigeria? Now, if you are telling the EU and the developed countries not to give anybody visa, let it start from Muhammad Buhari himself. Let it start from Audu Ogbe, the silly man who is telling them not to give people visas. Look at these people, they are very insensitive. They don't think before they talk because they lack the intellectual capacity to lead Nigeria out of the crisis that they put Nigeria. I have no fear about these people. If they, want to, if, if they want to face me, let them take me to court. I will prove everything I'm saying. Now, going back to the situation, I'm an ordained minister, I'm a pastor. There is something called homiletics and ethics. You do not reveal names. Now, when um, uh, I was planning for this elaborate event for Leah Sharibu's birthday, you know, I was planning an elaborate event, I called um, uh, uh, several people. One of them I called uh, is a gospel uh, a singer. Um, she's also into um, uh, visual um, uh, um, artistry. And I called her, you know, and uh, I was talking to her. And while I was talking to her, you know, she hung up the phone on me. And so, I mean, at, at that point, I didn't realize she hung up the phone. So I kept on trying to call her. And then later, she visited my call. And then I sent her a text message. Look, all I want you to do is just record a happy birthday message to Leah Sharibu. And then she just sent me a message, um, uh, I'll call you soon. And you know, I mean, I was, I was, I was flabbergasted. And then while I was just, uh, um, while, while I was flabbergasted, I got a call. Um, I didn't even call. I got a call from the former governor of, uh, um, well, I don't want to mention the state, a northern state, a, pro a prominent Muslim. And then I told him, look, this is what I want to do. Wanna, what, this is what I want to do for Leah. And he just told me, I will do it. I called uh, Senator Ali Ndume and I said, look, this is what I want to do for Leah. I want you to record a happy birthday message. And he said, ah, Reno, I will do it. I called several other prominent Muslims, you know, and they said, I will do it. And then I called uh, uh, Bovi, the comedian. In fact, Bovi was on a plane. And then he took my call and said, look, I'm, I'm on a plane. As soon as I land, I will do it. Senator Ben Murray Bruce, I will do it. Several prominent people, they said they were going to do it. So, you know, I was a bit disappointed, you know, with this, uh, with this particular girl. But however, Dr. Abati, it's wrong to say that Christians do not help each other. Christians do help each other. Christians help each other. Look, I've been selling these clothes, this clothes, uh, this free Leah Sharibu uh, clothes. You know, what I did was that I put the account number of Leah Sharibu's father. I put it on, um, on my website and on social media. And I said, look, you buy it for me. I'll send it to you. But you pay to Leah Sharibu's uh, uh, um, uh, parents. And overwhelmingly, Christians have helped me. They've shown a lot of love. And not just that, you know, I've gotten people, you know, who have come to me to say, look, what can they do for Leah's family? Do they need a car? Do they need homes? And it's, so it's wrong to say that you cannot use the behavior of one person and use it to tarnish um, an entire faith. And then on this particular issue of the pastor you're talking about, what you said is incorrect. And I know that you were misled, so I'm going to tell you the fact. It is not true. This pastor's case is not what was being talked about. Femi Fanny Kayode and uh, some other people, you know, what they put online is actually, um, and I, they didn't do it deliberately, but they, did, they, they didn't get the facts. I'm, I, I'm a researcher. I found out what happened. This young man had um, issues. Uh, it, was not, uh, it did not pertain to accommodation. The church, the Redeemed Christian Church of God, a member of that church, a member of the, ch of the local parish where he, was, um, where he had been a member because he was no longer a member as at the time of his death. He had left that parish and had gone to another church. But even though he had left, a member of that church gave him a house to stay free of charge. He did not have accommodation problems. That is a lie. He did not have accommodation problems. A member, can you imagine he had left the church? And yet, a member of that parish gave him a house to stay free of charge at Sunnyvale Estate. So that's, that situation is not true. Now, uh, I believe that within Christian Church of God is going to come out with a statement as to the real situation. You know, uh, um, facts have come out why the man um, uh, took that decision that he took. And it, I think it had to do with a relationship that he had that had gone south. So uh, this information, you know, I, I, I'm going to put it this way, you know, um, the media like to sensationalize things regarding pastors. 
because you know I don't know it sells, and we know we have some uh, silly people on social media who do not know their left from their right, who do not who don't understand scripture, who just rush out there Rena, and then um, or any, they attack any man of God. <laughs> has to be a favorite word of yours, but we ask you to, even though you clearly have strong opinions, to refrain yourself from name calling of any kind. Now I have a question for you regarding well, the I'm African. I'm not calling any names. Silly. <laughs> the African continent. No, I'm not calling any names. No, what you, I said you, was you that you referred yeah. to somebody as a silly as a man. Silly man, yes. That's a bit <laughs> and, harsh. and I was a bit too strong Somewhat for television. Harsh. Yes. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement. The, the, the gentleman that you had before me used uh, a word that I will never use in private and public. You did not caution him. I did. Now, you want to caution him for using silly. No, no, I, I did. did. I did, he actually did. I did. He actually did. <laughs> he actually did. So, uh, um, I want to talk to you about the African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement. Uh, question about uh, the African Free Trade, I think. Yes. yes. So Gambia has now ratified it, making them the 22nd nation to do so. It's reportedly going to be operational within a month. Nigeria is missing out. Nigeria has not ratified this. What is your view on this? Bearing in mind that the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria are expressing satisfaction with the fact that Nigeria is sitting this out and having this protectionist policy. They feel that they're trying to protect Nigeria. They've lobbied the government to protect Nigeria from becoming a dumping ground for foreign goods, in quotes. What's your view? Well, you know, if I want to say that word again, you guys will caution me, so I'm not going to say that word. But it, that, that view by the government of Mama Dubari and the Manufacturer, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria is that word that you don't want me to use. So I won't use that word. I don't know if you're aware, but last year I did a TED talk, um, a TED Apata, and I addressed this issue of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. You know, as part of my Free Lea Sharibu movement, I had to go to several South African countries. I was in South Africa, uh, Zambia. Uh, and uh, no, I was in South Africa, then from there I went to Zimbabwe. From Zimbabwe, I walked to Zambia. And um, I was in Kenya, Tanzania, um, Mozambique, uh, Zanzibar. Now, the issue is that I needed visas to go to all these places. I needed visas. But while I was there, uh, because you know, I, um, I'm a US resident, you know, so I, I traveled with my assistants. My assistants, my American assistants, they did not need visas. Now, I'm an African. I needed visas to travel. I felt so ashamed that my American staff were traveling with me and they did not need visas. Now, you can just imagine that. Um, Aliko Dankote said he was invited by the president of Angola. And he had to get a visa. Now, this is the richest man in Africa. Now, if, for instance, you know, uh, Bill Gates wants to go to Angola, he doesn't need a visa. He can just go there. So, you know, we need to have this after the Continental Free Trade Agreement because Nigeria has more to take to these countries than these countries that a lot of these countries don't have the capacity to flood Nigeria. I've been to so many African countries. I was in Seychelles. In Seychelles, believe it or not, I was in my hotel room, the clean out, um, uh, I was at a, a luxury hotel paid for by a friend. And then uh, the, the, a cleaner came into my room, and he told me, oh, where are you from? I said, I'm from Nigeria. I said, oh, he knows Nollywood. I said, go away. You don't know Nollywood. And then the man started calling, reading out the names of Nollywood stars. And I was shocked. And then he says, yes. And then he, he, he stopped from Nollywood, and he started reading out the names of Nigerian singers. In a lot of these countries, you see that they have so much respect for Nigeria. And you know, people, once people buy your culture, they will buy your goods. And so this Africa Free Trade Agreement, the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria is saying that it's going, to flood, uh, it's going to allow these nations to flood Nigeria. These nations don't have the capacity to flood Nigeria. It is Nigeria that will flood this country. Pe look, GLOW can be in all these African countries. Zenith Bank can open branches in all of these countries. In Uganda, uh, 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 I believe it is a GT Bank, you know, you have all, the, all of these banks there. Nigerians in these countries will dominate those markets. And I'll give you a very good example. In 2014, Africa as a whole made $2.4 billion from coffee. Now, the whole continent of Africa made $2.4 billion from coffee. Now, in that same year, 2014, Germany, one country, made $3.8 billion from re-exporting coffee 
that they had brought, that they had export, uh, imported from Africa. Now, can you imagine how, uh, uh, that? The reason why they did that is because they, export, they imported the coffee from Africa and then they added value to it in Germany. Now, if we had the after, instead of taking that coffee to Germany, there are places in Nigeria, there are places in South Africa, there are places in uh, Rwanda, because uh, the visionary government of uh, Paul Kagame is doing a lot in Rwanda. I mean, you need to travel to Rwanda to see what's happening in Rwanda. That we could add value to this coffee. And then instead of Germany making uh, 3.8 billion out of goods that come out of Africa, that money will circulate in Africa. Because you have to realize that Africa has the lowest intra-regional trade in the whole world. Our, more Afri African countries do more business with uh, other continents than they do within themselves. I think that the figure is 18% um, of Africa's trade is intra-Africa. 92% of Africa's trade is outside Africa. So we need the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement free trade agreement to stop this. And like I've told you, Muhammad Buhari and his government, they lack the intellectual capacity to understand these things. This is a man who has not built one single school. And then he's saying that, oh, he feels sorry for Amajiris. If you feel sorry for Amajiris, why won't you build schools for them? First, former President Jonathan built 165 Almajiri schools all over northern Nigeria, nine universities. How many has this man built? Yet, for last month, they announced that they are building six prisons. Of course, you are going to be building prisons if you are not building schools. Well, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission just well, recently well, built... Right no, let me finish. They just recently right uh, uh, finished a 24 billion Naira headquarters. This administration has not spent 24 billion on any Nigerian university. Well, right that now. is why they, they, they are spending money arresting people instead of spending money arresting illiteracy. Well, Reno, we'll have to bring this to a close. I see you are very passionate about this subject. And again, we want to commend you uh, for what you are doing for Leah Sharebo, helping to put the issue out there in the front burner. On the issue of the African continental free trade, indeed, you know, the position of the Nigerian government is that, you know, they are consulting and that uh, very soon, you know, they will take a position and we will know uh, what has been decided at the end of the day. I don't think they've closed the issue yet because there are, you know, quite, uh, you know, uh, a number of people too uh, who think that that uh, deal will be of uh, great value uh, to Nigeria in terms of how we engage with the rest of Dr. Africa. Dr. Abati, Dr. Abati, Muhammad Buhari said he was consulting. He he actually said that he was consulting last year. He didn't say he's consulting this year. He said that he was consulting last year. As I speak to you right now, today, this is the 17th day of May. So how long does it take for him to consult? You well, see that you are buttressing my fact that this man lacks the intellectual capacity <laughs> to lead Nigeria out of the crisis that no, he has No, I'm just trying to. I'm, no, I'm just, is, he said no, that, I believe he made that statement in November. So after six months, he's still consulting? No, Ms. the Minister of Trade, Industry and uh, you know, uh, Development also commented on this. Uh, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt because the discussion over the uh, AFCTA is still uh, continuing. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming to the morning show. Uh, we've enjoyed, uh, you know, having a conversation with you, even if we thought, you know, some of your words were too strong and ash. But thank you all the same.